Hello magpies, and welcome back to part two of the history of my Dungeons and Dragons world. Last time, our adventuring heroes, the shields of oak and rain, grew from obscurity to national heroes of Cormia. The elf dragon was defeated, ending the goblin wars, and an infant king was crowned. Likewise, the city of Shade was destroyed and a new archmage stepped forth onto the pages of history. The cast of characters is set. And so, let us swoop on in as the story continues. As Cormier settled down into a brief time of relative peace, the shields of oak and rain set out once more upon a final fateful quest. Hearing rumours of the death of the drow goddess Lolf and of a great civil war sweeping across the Underdark, a dark elf member of the shields begged Aeron, who is now an executive member of the Royal Heralds, to mobilise the adventurers one last time to travel to the Bro capital, Menza Berenzan, to discover what had happened to her people. Thus, the shields entered the Underdark, never to be seen again. Before leaving, however, they hired a divination magic specialist to scry upon their progress, so we know some of what transpired. We know, for example, that they arrived at the subterranean city to find it burning. We know as well that the Drow Goddess of Undeath, Kiaransa Lee, had made a play for power to usurp the vacuum of power left by the disappearance of Lolf, and that she was in the process of converting the remaining living Drow to revenants under her control. One such revenant, it turned out, was none other than Lynchavari's long lost lover, Tomas, who it turned out wielded a familiar, curious stone ring that the gods, even the Banshee Queen herself, feared to touch, let alone approach. We may extrapolate that this stone ring was none other than Sudarshana Chakra of Kalashite myth, and the weapon by which the Spider Queen's assassination was made possible. After partially breaking Kiaransili's hold on Tomas, Linchavari swore that he would kill the Banshee Queen, and here, here the historical records become very vague. Not even communing with the gods will give a clear idea as to the sequence of events that followed, or indeed their meaning. So I shall stick with the details that are supported by more than one contemporary source, and in turn I shall leave the conspiracies to the conspiracy minded. We know that the Underdark was near destroyed taking a part of the Dale lands above it as a great sinkhole opened and some monster, sometimes described as a giant Faerim, and sometimes as a spider of unimaginable proportions, tore its way up out of the earth. In the Western Heartlands, they claim it strode across land to reach the ocean where it drank the sea dry, causing its belly to burst and resulting in a massive tidal wave. But in the Dale Lands, they claim that all of the greatest heroes of Faerun gathered to defeat it as it emerged from the earth. Details are unclear, but the existence of this monster is found in all contemporary accounts in one form or another. Its black blood, it was said, 
seemed to curse the earth as it was spilled. And it came to be that within a decade of the monster's appearance, most of the nations of Faerun came to be embroiled in a bloody and brutal conflict. Where did the war start? How did it begin? The causes certainly seemed to be as many as there were actors, but it was almost as if all of the leaders of the world fell to a mind poison infected with jealousy, turning to squabbling and filled with hatred. On one side, forming the largest host was a mighty army led by the Red Wizards of Fae and their allies, purportedly corrupted and empowered from the, by the blood of Loth bubbling up from the earth. Opposing them, Cormir and its allies stood strong and tall, led by the steel princess Alusair herself. The battle lines stretched from the Dale lands to Anorak, while poets describe a kind of blood madness infecting the world, such that total war became the only concern of men. It is said as well that the gods themselves descended from the heavens, took sides, and did battle upon the mortal plain beside their champions. When all was said and done, and the last blood was spilled, something, something happened to the world. It was as if the spark of divinity flickered and blinked out, and the gods fell silent, no longer willing to answer prayers nor offer up their magic to mortal beings. It was as if all of the gods had killed one another upon the blood-soaked battlefield, or simply walked away from humanity in disgust over all that had transpired. Likewise, there were no more heroes left, and Faerun entered a dark age. Without healing magic, medicine was rudimentary, primitive at best, and diseases swept unchecked through the land. Within two decades of the war's end, half the population of Faerun lay dead. The elves vanished, retreating from the world entirely, while half-elves began to inexplicably go insane, until there were none left except the spymaster Mendril Bellerod himself, whom it is said was kept sane only by his zealous devotion to the Cormirian crown. The dwarves, for their part, they retreated into their mountain strongholds and sealed the doors, adopting a policy of strict isolationism. Halflings, well they, they suffered the worst, being on the fringes of human society. Halflings were frequently scapegoated as rumours began to circulate of their taste for human flesh as if they were the only ones who were forced to resort to such measures to survive. Indeed, fear and tribalism seized the hearts of millions. Meanwhile, in Cormia, the child king Azun V came of age. Protected by his archmage Simon the Great, by his spymaster Mendril Bellerod, and of what remained of his aunt's noble army, now known as the Imperial Guard, Azun remained unaffected by the plagues and the desperation sweeping the land. Organized religion had collapsed as many, so many, had devolved into hedonism, convinced that the gods had abandoned them and that a horrible death was inevitable. Yet there remained a small sect of priests of Lathanda the Morning Lord, 
who would have been seen as heretical in any other age. They protected the libraries of the royal palace and, as the young king insisted on continuing his education, these, these priests, they caught the king's ear. They called themselves inquisitors, in a reference to, the, to their philosophy of strict adherence to almost scientific rigours of inquiry. They believed that humanity was capable of achieving great things through progress made possible by dialectics, by experimentation and by research, with or without the gods. Then one day, as the world fell apart outside the castle walls, these priest scholars came to the young king with a discovery that would save humanity. The Inquisitors believed that they had found a way to reignite the divine spark that connected mortals with the gods. It's conducive to their central philosophy, this new system of prayer was dependent upon the collective will of humanity devoted to a single goal. When many people hold faith, they explained, when many act as one and see themselves as one people, then, and only then, their combined act of prayer, as many wills work together, could re-establish the connection to the divine. Though the gods remained silent, speaking only through the intermediary of their celestials, now once again, their granted powers could be accessed through a homogeneity of religious practice. They called upon the young king to establish a bureaucracy, overseeing the restoration of divine magic. And thus was the Inquisition formed. Law, faith and order were soon restored to Cormia by demonstrations of divine magic and in no small part due to the emergence of a cult, of a cult that worshipped the Obiskia king as a god on earth. Thereafter, Azun set out to save the rest of the world, mobilizing the newfound power of communal faith. He called for a holy war to bring faith back to the four corners of Faerun. His target for this armed pilgrimage was none other than the old enemy Thay, who opposed Cormia in the God's War. The fortresses and the towers of the Red Wizards were very quickly overcome by the force, by the speed, by the strength and the zealotry of Cormia's religious fanatics. All the while, while cities burned in the sky above, Simon did battle with the most powerful Thean sorcerers. Such was the fury of this war, that almost nothing was left of Thay but rubble and salted earth. The immeasurable wealth of the Red Wizards, plundered from all of their neighbors over centuries, was brought back to Cormia to rebuild and to fund the expansion of divine power. Among the plunder were a number of familiar stone fragments, once part of a stone ring, that were auspiciously found some years prior by a secret Thayan expedition into the heart of the ruined Underdark and then brought back to Thay and now brought to Cormia. The next kingdom to fall to the Holy War was the old enemy of Cormia, the Majocracy of Sembia. As the armies stood by, Simon battled the Archwizards of Sembia upon the roof of a great cathedral, and then, when the last Sembian Archmage fell, there was no longer any denying that Simon had become the most powerful wizard on earth. 
and Sembia surrendered to him personally, granting him the name Magnus, meaning the Great One. Avoiding great bloodshed by this duel of wizards, the victorious, victorious Cormirian forces withdrew, leaving behind a distinguished paladin to represent Sembia's interests to the Cormirian throne. Other nations seeing that if they surrendered they would not face the same fate as they, many quickly fell in line. When divine magic was at last restored to all of the lands, from the western heartlands to Great Mulharand, from the Great Glacier to the Chiltern Peninsula, the Paladin ambassadors left behind as representatives of all of the conquered nations met at the Council of Shieldmeet and asked the Inquisition to crown Azun V as Holy Emperor and as Saviour of Faerun. The Empire was then separated into a republic of five independent palatinates, each with a capital state answering to Azun and responsible for protection of the Lower Kingdoms. Finally, after Half a century of strife and discord, there was peace at last. There grew out of the ashes a generation that knew none of the hardships of their parents, or indeed with half of the population of the world dead, now there was arable farmland and there were opportunities for everyone to grow wealthy or at least to be well fed. Elves came to be sighted in Toril once again, but they too were changed. Human parents would awake to find that their baby had been stolen in the night, replaced by an elven child. These fallen elves, as they came to be known, matured as quickly as humans, but showed a tendency for depressive states, for rages, and for wild fits of passion that caused them to be distrusted in many villages. Having spent half of his life at war, Azun tried to settle down but the ghosts of conflict and the fall of empires never truly left his mind. When tragedy took his empress and his two sons away, he retreated from public life almost completely. And those of his advisors who possessed long memories feared that without an heir to the throne, the peace might be shattered once again. Thank you, magpies. And things, things are certainly heating up. Out of this crucible and in the shadow of this great disaster, what new world shall emerge? I hope you will join me to find out as we continue the story next time.